you've got questions about folding proteins, running an AI, starting a search engine, we've got answers. We're going to take a look at the Dell Blade Center. The Dell M1000E is actually pretty old. Now, the current type of machine that you can buy from Dell still supports being in a Blade Center. Generally speaking, a Blade Center is a 10 year, maybe a 15 year piece of equipment. It's designed to be a chassis to help you have a really, really uh, sort of dense compute setup. So in terms of rack mount gear, this is 10U of rack space. You know, a normal, you know, six and a half foot rack, seven foot rack is uh, 42U of space. And so this is 10U. Theoretically, you can get four of these in a rack, although nobody's crazy enough to put four of these in a rack. Usually it's three and then some power distribution hardware, maybe three and some sands, rack mount sands, something like that. So what we're going to take a look at is the Dell M1000E Blade Center. We're going to give a little run over of what we got here. We've got these are three different types of blades that will go into this gigantic beast of a machine here. We've got the M600, which is a little, it's, it's the oldest of the three that we have. This one's got a four core Xeons, but it's still dual socket. So dual socket Xeons, it can handle up to a lot of RAM. I mean, a lot, a, a lot. Did I say a lot? A lot. Anyway, so this here is the 610. It's a slightly upgraded model, a little bit newer, newer socket. And this one's got six cores in the Xeons that we've got in here. This one's empty, but it also handles up to 96 gigs of RAM total between the two CPUs. Now, the 620 is really the gem of the bunch, but it's also the most expensive. You've got dual socket and they're Xeons, but they are the eight core Xeons, and it can handle 32 gig DIMMs, which means this thing here can handle up to 256 gigs per blade. That's a lot of memory. Uh, it's insane amount of memory, so that's what that is. Now, this wouldn't be complete without, you know, having to be able to tie into the fabric back structure that is part of the blade structure itself. So each one of these cards here, which is like this, this is a mezzanine card. It's a PCI Express bus, and that's what it looks like. Imagine if this was the actual expansion card for your home computer. Look how big that is. This is a Q-Logic Fiber Channel HBA. So this right here slots in and it uses a fiber channel to connect to the back, the back plane, but it has to have a fiber channel back plane in the blade enclosure for it to actually work. This here is a quad port gig card. So it's a four gigabit network adapters. And we got this one. This one here is really the gem. This is a 10 gig 10 gig network adapter. So it's 10 gig ethernet. This one here is a quad port gigabit ethernet. And there's one other that we had. Uh, that's the HBA, this one here. So we'll step over here. This is a dual, dual port gigabit ethernet adapter. And check this out. It is easy to install. That's it, we're all done. I'll give you an idea of exactly how big these things are. This is two inches up, two inches across here. I mean, it's really not that big. I mean, it's, it's not the heavy, heaviest thing. There's no fans, uh, there's no ports, there's nothing at all. This is literally just CPUs, memory, and your mezzanine cards. So yeah, there's no, there's no RJ45 connectors, there's no anything, there's really, this is it. This right here ties into the fabric backplane. You've got power. And then this is basically like a PCI Express bus that just connects right up into the back plane of the enclosure, which is behind me. This thing's huge. All right, so this is the back end of the blade center. Uh, we've got two CMCs. These are basically, they are redundant control modules. And then we've got a KVM. It's an iKVM, which means it connects up to a network adapter and you can remote in and control everything in the entire enclosure from the blade center's modules itself to each blade individually. The control modules themselves have their own network port and you'll see that this one here is connected to our, this cable is connected to our network and then the yellow cable is actually running between the two and it is the stack port. So this one is feeding through this one to get to the, get to the, external, uh, the, the external network. And this one's got the blue light which means this one's actually acting as the primary. This one's acting as the secondary and it's feeding through the two. So this is like mostly for SSH type connectivity and also for web-based access. The iKVM has got a couple of cool parts about this. It's not only for local connectivity via the keyboard video mouse, it's also got a network port that connects up into your network and you can access it remotely using some KVM software to 
tie in and control all 16 blades, including the enclosure itself. So I've been talking about fabric and the fabric backplanes. And what you've got is you've got three backplanes. Each one of these main cards controls what you want to put into the A, B, or C slot. Well, A is always going to be matching up with your, your blades. So in this case, we've got our blades are all gigabit. So our main connection here is a gigabit connection to everything else. This fabric B, and it's redundant, so you've got two copies of the same thing. It is 16 ports on the inside, and then this one here has got four ports on the outside. In this case here, fabric B is gigabit. Fabric C, however, this is our 10 gig. So it's 16 10 gig ports on the inside, and then it's four external ports, and you can even extend that out to having an additional 10 gig module down below. For the 10 gig, it's actually got a couple of different options. You can have the SFP modules here for fiber connectivity, or you can swap these out and you put eight, gig, uh, eight 10 gig copper connections. So you can have up to 16 external ports as well for 10 gig, which is really great. So you got six power supplies, and these things are hefty, and they're running on 208 volt, and you got to have a 30 amp PDU because this thing is pretty. It, it sucks a lot of juice. You can see ours back there is it's just eating power. Eats about as much as a dryer on full blast. So you can swap your dryer out for one of these things. And you actually might be able to put the same amount of air past it. So you can just put like a line and dry your clothes off the back of these things if you have it in your laundry room. Don't do that. It's also got nine, uh, nine fans. These things are blowing air or pulling air through the entire system and just blasting me right now. This is it's actually nice and cold because there's only one blade on. Let's turn them on and see how loud it gets. I'm just going to turn them on one by one. And now we wait. This turns all these crazy things on. You can see them come on one by one. And as they come on, it kicks the fans up because it knows it's going to need them. These things take a long time. After a power outage, rebooting these things are terribly not fun. Which is why it's got six power supplies. <laughs> if you want these hooked up to the same circuit like we do, you're stupid. You'd never do this in production. <laughs> Not only would it be two or three different circuits, it would be two or three different electricity providers, ideally. <laughs> you should do this under six electricity providers, six different circuits, just, yeah, full redundancy. Full, like really full. Six power generators, six battery backups, six everything. How serious are you? And this isn't even because of the drives, man. This is just straight up, hi, I'm a server and I have to go through this really, really obnoxious BIOS booting thing. See that? Look at that, it skipped. It's trying to make a liar out of me. Okay, so we can see here that we've only got, what, 48 gigs of system memory? You're insane. I thought you said 96. I did. I did say 96. Bam, right there, 96 gigs. You can see that it's 96 gigs, DDR3, error checking, it's awesome. But we have this set up in a redundant memory, so you actually are using only 48. But seriously, that's still 750 gigs of memory. That's a lot. I don't know people, I know people who don't even have hard drives that big. Have you ever used any of the new I, uh, IKVMs from Dell? This is the kind of setup you look at. You know, you hit control twice and you get to scroll through all of this stuff. Everything from the CMC all the way down to slot 16. And you can just grab any one of these at random and you can watch the machine boot up. We don't have any drives in most of these, but there you go. There's the 610. You can go into system services and it's just like sitting in front of this machine. And I like, let's just go to this one because I don't want that one anymore. We're waiting for that one. It's too long. Here you go. You can see two six gig, two six core processors. They're not running very fast, only 2.66. Now, you might be wondering why we have these fiber lines and where they're going. So right now we've got two 10 gig connections per, per side. So this is CMC1, CMC2, and they have basically it's a redundant set of connections. So we got four 10 gig connections going over here to the back end of this gigantic beast, which is our SAN. It's got a lot of hard drives, lots. Like, not enough for my taste, but still a lot of hard drives. So this model is the older model. It can only handle two terabyte drives. So it can handle up to 48 terabytes of storage. Now that's not full capacity, because usually with that kind of space and that number of drives, 
you want to have a little bit of redundancy, so you're going to do either like a RAID 5, RAID 6, or in some cases you might just say, screw it, do RAID Z across the entire array, and you'd still drop in a couple of drives for, again, your redundancy, your parity, and whatnot to make sure that you don't lose data, because that's the worst thing ever, to have 24 hard drives, one fail, and suddenly you lose all your data. Don't ever do that. You do that, I'm gonna come to your house and kick you. Now, in addition to all of that storage that we've got externally, internally, each one of these blades can handle two SAS drives, or SATA, depending on what you put inside, depending on how you order them. This one here has 146 gig, two 10,000 10, RPM, 146 gig drives, you can mirror them, you can stripe them, you can do whatever you want, or you can put SSDs if you really wanted to go crazy. I mean, there's a lot of options here, uh, but it ultimately you don't even need them because you can iSCSI boot everything in this from the sand. So that's always a fun option, but these things just slot right in. Now this one here we have loaded up with 610s. So with that, we've got 192 cores. That's a lot of cores. Each one's got dual six core Xeons, and it's got 96 gigs each. It's 1.4 terabytes of RAM. I know what you're thinking. This is the smallest video card you've ever seen in your entire life, and you're probably right. This is not really for anything other than provides video connectivity for your DRAC, which is the Dell Remote Access Controller. Since this is all Dell equipment, that's basically what it is. It's a built-in uh, IKVM for each one of these machines. Each one's got one, but this right here fits in this fancy little v PCI Express slot. That's it. Your entire system is enclosed into an inch and a half of space. And that's a blade center. And that particular blade center has been retired from production use. But, you know, it gives you an idea of the kind of hardware that's available in the enterprise. Now, typically a blade center like that, you're only going to see in a data center where space is at a premium. So we're talking a metropolitan data center. Blade centers really cost extra versus the same amount of computational hardware in a normal rack mount configuration. Normally, I mean, that was 16 computers. Normally, you would get rack mount computers that would fill a whole rack mount cabinet. Everything with that has been miniaturized, so it's basically inside a two-foot cube. Not quite exactly, but we're talking about one and a half terabytes of RAM and 192 cores inside a two-foot cube. And basically, all that hardware was about three or four years old, plus or minus give or take. So you can imagine that a modern system, you know, with the blades, 18 cores per blade, 256, maybe 512 gigabytes of RAM per blade, we're talking about an exponential increase in terms of compute density. Yeah, it produces a lot of heat, yeah, a whole bunch of other stuff, but if you're running Hadoop or compute cluster tasks or MapReduce functions or you're do doing GIS or search engine stuff or you're going to start your own ISP or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is going to give you an insane amount of money, you know, whatever you happen to be working on, this is a ton of compute power and you can provision it and set it up in a cluster so that, you know, tasks are handled in a distributed fashion across all of the computers. So for a lot of tasks, like I mentioned, you know, including 3D rendering and, and that sort of stuff as well, you can really get a lot of performance out of this kind of hardware. So it's really exciting to work on this kind of stuff. We don't very often get a, get a chance to do videos and this kind of thing when this hardware was new it was well over a hundred thousand dollars it's not unusual these days to spend you know 175 200 225 thousand dollars on a fully kitted out blade center with a couple of sands it's really not unusual that you're going to spend north of 150 thousand dollars so you can imagine we don't really very often get to do a video on it but for this particular setup we thought we would show you guys what you can get in the really upper echelons of things and the kinds of things that you can get when you want to cram a terabyte of memory into a two-foot cube. I'm Wendell Lock signing out, and I'll see you later.